Hey y'all, I have here a book about Dolly Madison. It was published in 1896. So be forewarned, there are passages in here where issues of slavery are simply taken for granted. To begin on chapter one, Dolly Madison, one, childhood. The swallows must have twittered too above her head. The roses blew below, no doubt, and sure the south crept up the wall and kissed her mouth, that wistful mouth which comes to me linked with her name of Dorothy. It would have been a bold soothsayer who had ventured to predict a brilliant social and worldly career for the little maid who in revolutionary days was tripping along the forest paths under the shadow of Virginia pines to the old field school in Hanover County where Dorothy Payne learned her ABCs. In truth, no one could have looked less frivolous than this demure schoolgirl with the sober gown reaching to the toes of her shoes, the long gloves covering her dimpled elbows, the linen mask and broad-brimmed sunbonnet hiding her rosy face. Yet an eye trained to fortune-telling might perchance have caught a glimpse of a glittering chain about the white neck under the close pinned kerchief and guessed the guilty secret of hidden finery which, is, which it held and which gave the lie to the profession of a renounced vanity which her garb suggested. If anyone was responsible for Dolly Payne's lapse from the severe simplicity of the sect of friends in after years, it must have been the worldly-minded grandmother who, in this early time, supplied the bits of jewelry worn thus under the rose of, Dorothy's, of Dolly's blushes. The sins of vanity and secretiveness met with the retribution which such wickedness merited, and on one of these fine summer days, after a woodland, woodland wandering, the chain and bag and finery were all missing, and the guilty little heart was ready to burst with grief over the loss of its treasures. There was one person, at least, to whom the culprit could carry the story of her affliction, one with ear always open and heart always full of sympathy for the child who, as a baby, had been laid in her arms and hushed on her faithful black breast. This was Mother Amy, a typical Southern mammy, whose turbaned head had nodded many a night from dusk till dawn over little Dolly's cradle while her soft Negro voice crooned lullabies. But that was in the days of Dolly's babyhood. Years before she grew into the schoolgirl, indifferent to books and fond of dress, as she continued to be in her simple, natural fashion to the end of her life. His Majesty, King George III, still ruled in America when little Dorothy Payne was born, and it was in His Majesty's province of North Carolina that her blue baby eyes unclosed like soft violets on the 20th of May in the year 1768. The child was named Dorothea in honor of Dorothea Spotswood Dandridge, daughter of Nathaniel West Dandridge, and granddaughter of the long-remembered Governor Alexander Spotswood. Nine years after the birth of her little namesake, this lady became the wife of the famous orator Patrick Henry and later of Judge Edmund Winston, both cousins of Dolly Payne's mother. By her marriage with Patrick Henry, she added nine children of her own to the six left him by his first wife. Large families were the fashion in old colony days, and by every hearthstone of rich and poor alike played little children in, numer in numbers which our degenerate age would reckon intolerably burdensome. Dolly Payne's future. Dolly Payne's future husband, James Madison, was the oldest of many brothers and sisters, 
and Dolly herself, the eldest daughter, was followed by a train of younger children to whom, in after years, she showed herself a most affectionate and devoted sister, as their mutual letters amply prove. Although the chances of a parental visit placed her birth in North Carolina, Dolly Payne was a good right, had a good right to call herself a child of that Virginia which she loved so well. A Virginian she was, both by lineage and residence. Her grandfather, John Payne, was an English gentleman of wealth and liberal culture who came over to Virginia and planted himself in the country, in the county of Goochland, which lies along the northern shore of the James River above Richmond. He took to wife Anna Fleming. This colonial dame was alleged to have been a descendant of the Earl of Wigdon, a Scottish nobleman. But this is disputed. And as Virginians of that day were wont to trace their ancestry to the aristocracy of Great Britain as naively as the Roman emperors derived theirs from the gods, this genealogy must be taken with a grain of salt by sober students of history. The Scottish descendant, however, Miss Fleming undoubtedly was. Of Scottish descent, however, Miss Fleming undoubtedly was. Her son, John Payne Jr., the father of Dorothy, migrated in his turn to a plantation in North Carolina where he met, courted, and married Mary, a daughter of William Coles, who came from Enniscorthy, a town on the banks of the River Slaney in County Wexford, Ireland. Thus the three kingdoms blended their diverse strains of blood in the little maiden who slipped into life in the colony of North Carolina on this May Day in the latter part of the last century, and traces of each showed themselves in her character as it developed. If any one of these strains predominated, it was that, I should say, which came to her through Mary Coles, to which she owed her laughing Irish eyes, her heavy eyebrows, dark lashes, her long curling hair, the brilliancy of her skin, and perchance the smoothness of her tongue, which despite its tutoring in the plain thee and thou of Quaker speech, was the, and the strictness of Quaker truth-telling always suggested in its softness and ancestry not unacquainted with the groves and the, uh, and the magic stone of Blarney. Shortly after his marriage with Mary Coles, whom he had wooed and won in the teeth of many rivals, John Payne the Younger returned to Virginia and settled upon an estate in Hanover County, which lies north of the James River to the eastward of Goochland, where his father's home was situated, and at no great distance from Coles Hill, the maiden home of his bride. Here, in a mansion somewhat grander than its neighbors, as we may judge from Mrs. Madison's memories of it, with its brick outbuildings and its monumental mantles of marble, John Payne lived during the childhood of his eldest daughter. On this Hanover County plantation, with no large town nearer than Richmond, the little Dorothy, far from the world and its distractions, passed the days of her early youth in that close companionship with nature which makes the surest foundation for a happy life, as she herself recognized when, after the lapse of half a century, she wrote to her sister Anna from her estate at Montpelier, I wish, dearest, you had just such a country home as this. I truly believe it is the happiest and most true life and would be best for you and for your children. It is difficult for us, who live in the age of steam and electricity, when the round world is circled with iron rails and telegraph wires, to bring vividly before our minds the isolation of such an estate as that of the Paines in colonial Virginia. Even down to the time of the Revolution, roads to the southern colonies were few and rudely made, and the rivers continued to be the principal highways. Autumn rains and winter winds made travel an affair of difficulty and danger, and the inhabitants of the plantation were shut in for weeks together to the society of a small circle of whites 
and a retinue of black servants whose quarters were often merrier than the halls of the mansion house. The only relief from the monotony was the coming of a visitor from the outside world, and when the packet tied up to the wharf at the foot of the tobacco field, or the solitary rider lifted the latch of the five-barred gate with the handle of his riding whip, there was much joyous excitement within the household. Negro servants hastily, do hastily donned their new jackets, turbans, and fresh aprons were brought out, and a smiling train waited on the steps behind the hospitable master and mistress to do honor to the coming guest. The welcome extended to him was as sincere as it was hearty, and he could scarcely make too long a stay for the pleasure of his host. The best the house contained was at his service, and every energy was exerted for his entertainment. The, adjust, the amusements of those country houses, as a rule, were of a very primitive and simple nature, but they had one great advantage, which ours often lack. They did amuse. I hold in my hand the journal of a young lady of Virginia who jotted down her daily doings and experiences during a series of visits which she paid to hospitable homesteads in the Old Dominion in the year 1784, when she, like Gar Dorothy Payne, was some 16 summers old. It is full of mirth and runneth, running over with laughter and jollity. And all over what? A performance on the piano forti, uh, on the forty piano, a moonlight walk, the selecting of sweethearts by thistle blowing, a dance of half a dozen couples, a ride on horseback to the neighboring estate. I must tell you, she writes on one occasion, of our frolic after we went a home went to our room. We took it into our heads to want to eat. Well, we had a large dish of bacon and beef. B-E-A-F. You see, the Virginia maid of olden time was not strong on spelling. After that, a bowl of sago cream, and after that, an apple pie in bed. As though that were not enough. But no, after this, we took it into our heads to eat oysters. We got up, put on our wrappers, and went down to the cellar to get them. Do you think, Mr. Washington, did not follow us and scare us just to death. We went up, though, and ate our oysters. And there's, thus concludes today's reading.